good. It has to be a, qu- it has to be a quantum mechanics joke, okay. given the subject of the class. Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, administrative announcement, problem set six is here uh, for you to pick up. Uh, due next week, um, as usual. Um, today, I'm going to finish our discussion of discrete symmetries. Um, I'll study two of the most important types of discrete symmetries, which will lead us today into a, con- uh, a consideration of some uh, condensed matter uh, systems and um, a bit of an understanding of uh, the electron structure of metals and a band structure based on discrete symmetries. But before I do that, I want to consider one other important symmetry, which is very closely related to uh, the parity symmetry that we considered at the end of class, uh, at the beginning of class last time. And that is uh, time reversal symmetry. So what do we mean when we say that a system has time reversal symmetry. So classically, a system has time reversal symmetry, usually just denoted T, if X of T being a solution implies that X of minus T is a solution. So, of course, uh, for many simple Newtonian systems, this is simply a consequence of Newton's equations of motion. So, for example, if you look at Newton's law for a particle moving in some potential, then because the only time derivatives appearing in this equation are second time derivatives, taking t to minus t doesn't change the equation of motion. So if x of t is a solution, so will x of minus t. But there are also, it is important to remember, many sorts of classical systems without time reversal symmetry. So um, for example, A particle in a magnetic field has a Lagrangian. So let's consider a particle moving in the xy plane subject to a magnetic field that points in the z direction. Then you'll have the usual kinetic term plus a magnetic interaction that looks like B times XY dot minus YX dot. And you can see that because this magnetic interaction involves terms that are linear in time derivatives, the Lagrangian will actually change if you take T to minus T. And in particular, uh, it is not invariant under T goes to minus T. But instead, under a combined symmetry, where T goes to minus T, and the magnetic field switches direction. So a particle moving in a magnetic field is a simple example of a system which is not time reversal invariant. And indeed, it turns out that at the microscopic level, the laws of nature are not time reversal invariant. The standard model of particle physics is not time reversal invariant, nor is it parity invariant. It's only invariant under a combination of time reversal and parity symmetry, along with what is known as charge conjugation, which is the symmetry that interchanges particles and antiparticles. So I won't be discussing charge conjugation too much in this class, although I believe uh, in previous years I did assign it as a problem on the final exam. So uh, who knows, maybe you'll be lucky and I'll come up with another fun problem like that this year. Um, But um, I will spend a little bit of time discussing time reversal symmetry. So the interesting and novel uh, feature of time reversal symmetry is that in quantum mechanics, time reversal symmetry is not implemented by a unitary operator 
but rather by an anti-unitary operator. So what's the easy way of seeing why that is? Well, if you just look at Schrodinger's equation, which says that i times the time derivative of psi is 1 over h bar times the Hamiltonian acting on psi, then if you consider the case where the Hamiltonian describes some time reversal invariant system, such as a particle moving in a potential, then if psi is a solution regarded as a function of x and t, then psi of x and minus t is not necessarily a solution. But the complex conjugate of psi and x and minus t is a solution. So you see that taking uh, t goes to minus t in quantum mechanics requires one to also con complex conjugate the wave functions if you want to find uh, that you have a symmetry. So the process of time reversal involves complex conjugation. So I remind you that an anti-unitary operator uh, let's call it theta is a, an operator which differs from the usual linear operators that we typically consider in quantum mechanics. And it has the property that if you consider a linear combination of two kets, then when you move theta through one of the complex constants C and D, you need to perform the act of complex conjugation. So one of the things that we need to keep in mind when we consider antilinear operators then is that where you place numbers, how you order numbers in an expression involving an antilinear operator actually matters. So whether you put the constant C to the left or to the right of the operator theta um, actually matters in this expression. Okay. So. Um, uh, this is a case where the Dirac notation uh, falls a little bit short because we're so used to, uh, you know, moving constants around without regard to operators in Dirac notation uh, that uh, you need to be a little careful when dealing with antilinear operators. But as long as you, but in quantum mechanics, of course, we're used to dealing with objects that don't commute. Um, and so as long as you're careful uh, with the ordering of uh, numbers now, in addition to the ordering of operators, uh, you won't, uh, you won't uh, make any mistakes. But there are cases, such as uh, a case where I'll present to you momentarily, uh, where the ordering of an operator relative to a number is important in understanding exactly what it is uh, the operation of time reversal does to uh, states in quantum mechanics. Um, and um, just as a unitary operator is an operator which preserves the inner product of states, an anti-unitary operator doesn't preserve the inner product, but it preserves it up to complex conjugation. So if we let alpha tilde be theta times alpha, and beta tilde v theta times beta, then if we were considering a unitary operator, then the inner product of these two states would be equal to uh, the inner product of the original states. And for an anti-unitary operator, the property of anti-linearity means that you couldn't have these two expressions be equal but they could only be equal along with a complex conjugation. Okay. Remember, however, that we never actually, we only uh, really observe the norm of these overlaps. Well, that's not entirely true. For interference effects, we can observe uh, the phase. But 
For the purposes of considering uh, symmetries such as time reversal, uh, this is good enough. Okay. And indeed, just based on the form of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, you know that time reversal has to involve some sort of operation of complex conjugation. Uh, let me now uh, be a little more uh, specific about time reversal uh, symmetry. So the time reversal operator by definition is an operator which obeys the following condition. So let's imagine that you start with some state alpha and you act on it with the unitary time evolution operator. So e to the i ht over h bar uh, for some time independent Hamiltonian. And then, so that describes the state alpha evolved forward in time t. If you act on that with the, the action of time reversal, then what you'll get is the time reversal, uh, the unitary time evolution operator for a time minus t acting on theta times alpha. So if you think about it, this is really what we mean by a time reversal operator. The time reverse of the state at alpha t is the state uh, at alpha minus t. So what does this mean in terms of the Hamiltonian? So if we expand our unitary time evolution operator at small times, then this is 1 plus i h t over h bar plus higher order terms in t. And so just rewriting this equation, we see that this means that I, let's, how should I write this? This means that theta times I T H is equal to minus I T H times theta. Now, remember that when we pull this I through the theta over there, you'll get a complex conjugation, so that'll turn into minus i, okay? So that the i will cancel, the, the i on the right-hand side will cancel the minus i on, sorry, the i on the left-hand side will cancel the minus i on the right-hand side once you pull it through the action of this antilinear operator theta. The t's will cancel because t is real. And so you're left with the equation that, um, theta h is h theta, i.e. h and theta commute with one another. So this is the usual expression for a symmetry. Okay. Usually we've encountered symmetries as unitary operators that commute with a Hamiltonian. Here we see a time reversal operation is given by an anti-unitary operator that commutes with a Hamiltonian. Question. Um, I don't think it changes anything, but isn't ut e to the minus ihd? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. So I never, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Minus, plus, minus, minus, plus. Thank you. Okay. Good questions. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, How, uh, so theta will act on states by acting from the left or from, on kets by acting from the left, on bras by acting from the right. And just as we saw for unitary operators, one can define the action of an anti-unitary operator on some observable by performing a, con by performing a, a conjugation by that symmetry. And How do we expect this time reversal operation to act, for example, on the position 
and momentum operators for some observable, for some system. Well, it shouldn't act on the position of a particle, but it should take the momentum of a particle to minus the momentum. If you take uh, an object with some position and momentum, and you take t to minus t, its position won't change, but its momentum will change by a minus sign, because velocities dx by dt go to minus dx by dt when you perform a uh, time reversal operation. <coughs> so this property allows us to understand what the action of time reversal is acting on a wave function. So let's say we have some state alpha and it's time reversal theta alpha. Let's try and write out the wave function of the state theta alpha. And we can try and express it in terms of the wave function of the state alpha just by inserting uh, a by using our favorite fact that 1 is the integral dx of the projection operator onto a state x. So we can integrate, we can insert a complete set of states labeled by their x eigenvalue x prime. And then, so we can take this guy and move it through theta and when we do so, it will become complex conjugated. And the action of theta on x prime is trivial because theta commutes with x. So theta acting on x prime is just the state x prime. And so the overlap between x and x prime is just a delta function. And so what you're left with is the complex conjugate of the wave function of the state alpha. So as expected, when you act with time reversal on a state, its wave function will change just by complex conjugation. So what good is time reversal symmetry? Well, the important feature of time reversal symmetry, at least as far as I am concerned, is the following. If we have some Hamiltonian, which is time reversal invariant, then a non-degenerate energy eigenstate can be taken by a choice of phase to be real. Or to say that a little differently, is real times an overall position independent phase. This is the time reversal uh, version of the parity statement that if you have a parity invariant Hamiltonian, then your energy eigenstates are either even or odd if they're non-degenerate. Here, if you have time reversal invariance, the analogous statement is that your energy eigenstates can be taken to com be completely real functions of x just by some overall choice of phase. And remember, when you multiply a wave function by a phase, it doesn't change the actual quantum state. So why is that? Well. Let's consider an energy eigenstate and let's act on it with the operation of time reversal. So using the fact that H commutes with E, if we act on this with a Hamiltonian, this will be theta times H acting on E, which is of course theta times the number E acting on E. And because the Hamiltonian is Hermitian, the eigenvalue E is real, so I can freely pass it through the antilinear operator theta without it being complex conjugated. 
And so we conclude that if E is an energy eigenstate, then so is theta times E. And if the energy eigenstates are non-degenerate, that means that theta times E is equal to a phase times E. And remember, what is the action of theta on a wave function? Well, it complex conjugates it. And so if you have a wave function whose complex conjugate is just an overall phase times that original wave function, so that, for example, for a particle moving in one dimension, the wave function uh, psi of x would be an overall phase times the complex conjugate, I guess I should really write it like this, of psi of x, then that means by some judicious choice of phase, you could always take um, this wave function to be real. Yes? A non-energy eigenstate? Well, sorry, what did I? Uh, not, sorry, what did I mean? I meant non-degenerate. A non degenerate energy eigenstate. Thank you. Sorry about that. I uh, was speaking more quickly than I was writing. Uh, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, just to make that uh, clear, um, if you have a function whose complex where complex conjugation just multiplies you by an overall x-independent phase, then that means that that function is just some phase times a real function. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. If you consider the case where that phase is trivial, where it's just one, then complex, the statement that a function is equal to its complex conjugate is the same as the statement that is real. Okay. Um, if uh, that phase is not equal to one, if it's like e to the i uh, theta, I shouldn't call it theta, let's call it e to the i uh, phi, then you can easily just multiply your wave function by, I guess it would be e to the i phi over 2. Um, and then you'll see that uh, you would find something which is totally real. Remember in our discussion of the WKB approximation, when I derived the bohr sommerfeld quantization rule, I actually used this fact. And I told you I would prove it to you later. And I always keep my promises. That's not always true. I usually keep my promises when it suits me. Um, OK. Um, one other comment that I might, uh, might want to make is that, of course, if you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, um, such as a particle moving in some time-dependent field or something like that, then generally speaking, you won't have time reversal invariance. But it is possible to have um, versions of time reversal invariance where the system could be time reversal invariant, uh, where you take t uh, to minus t uh, reflecting in time only about a specific time. So for example, it's possible for a system to be time reversal invariant without being time translation invariant. Okay. So for example, if you consider a particle and a potential, um, which, is e which is an even function of t, even though it's a non-trivial function of t, then it would be invariant not under translations in t. So it wouldn't have time translation symmetry. So you wouldn't have a conserved energy. Okay? But you still might have a t goes to minus t symmetry. And there are actually plenty of examples of systems in nature which have precisely that property. And you can still use time reversal symmetry to constrain uh, you know, observations and results of the system, uh, even without a time a conserved energy. Okay. So for example, when we consider time-dependent Hamiltonians later in this course, um, we'll uh, discuss uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, which is a case where you have some system where you place it in an oscillating magnetic field, and you study uh, the response to that magnetic field in terms of transition amplitudes of states. That would be an example of a system without time translation invariance, so no conserved energy, but still with time reversal invariance. 
Good. Any questions? I'd like to spend the rest of class today talking about um, a final example of a class of discrete symmetries, which is slightly more interesting and has um, slightly more um, far-reaching consequences than the rather simple discrete symmetries that I've been discussing so far. So the symmetries that I would now like to discuss are variously referred to as lattice or discrete translation symmetries. Or uh, sometimes people uh, refer to them slightly more fancily as crystallographic symmetries. So before diving into the general theory of crystallographic symmetries, let's just consider the following simple example. Consider a particle moving in one dimension in a periodic potential. So that the Hamiltonian takes the usual form for a particle in a potential. But this potential has the property that it's invariant if you shift x by a. Okay. So if you like, you should keep in your mind the example of an, elect of an electron, which is moving in some uh, periodic lattice of atoms. So this is a very simple one-dimensional lattice. You just have a, an array of atoms equally spaced with distance a. And that electron will be subject to some potential due to the repulsion uh, due, due to the various electrostatic forces that it will experience due to the protons and the other electrons that might be present. But all you know about the system is that whatever potential it experiences will be periodic under this shift by a finite amount A. And we would now like to investigate what the consequences will be of this discrete symmetry. Unlike the discrete symmetries that we have considered earlier, this is an infinite discrete symmetry. So, in particular, if you consider the operator, T of A, which is the exponential of I, P, A over H bar, then this generates the symmetry where you shift X to X plus A. So, in particular, as... you in fact demonstrated on one of the earlier problem sets this semester, if you conjugate the operator x by e to the i p a over h bar, all that does is it shifts x by a constant. You guys all remember that, hopefully. This is presumably a familiar statement. It's just a consequence of the fundamental uh, commutation relation between x and p. And of course, the action of the Hermitian conjugate will take T of A to T of minus A. Just because P is a Hermitian operator and there's that factor of I in the exponential in the form of T. And the statement that our potential is periodic is the statement that H commutes with this translation operator T. And because H commutes with the translation operator T, an intelligent way to attempt to solve the problem would, it be, would be to use simultaneous eigenstates of T and H. So, I'm not going to try and solve, in general, the problem of an electron moving in an arbitrary periodic potential. Of course, that's a very, very difficult thing to try and do. So instead, what I'm going to do is present to you, first, a series of approximation techniques 
that can be used to study an electron moving in a periodic potential before, at the end of class today, hopefully if I have time, presenting to you a few elements of the general theory of uh, periodic potentials. So let's try and understand what the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is. So let's consider first the simple case where we have an infinite barrier between each of the different lattice sites uh, describing the atoms in this periodic array. array. So for example, if you have a potential V of X, then it's going to have some sort of periodic form. Okay. So it'll look like this, for example, where the spacing between successive peaks or troughs of the potential is given by A. And if you want to describe an electron moving in a metal, say, where each of the lattice sites are where one of the proton is, one of the protons is, or one of the nuclei is, of your periodic lattice of, of uh, atoms or molecules, then uh -oh. okay, I hope my computer's plugged in or something's otherwise my computer's going to die. That's not good. Okay. Are you plugged in? Sorry, it was just warning me. Hmm. Okay, it looks like the power cord's not working. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. Sorry about this. Ah, there we go. Now, of course, because it's plugged in, it automatically changes orientation. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Okay. Good. Is it upside down? No, it's right side up. You can never quite tell with these things. Okay, good. So um, let's, for example, consider a lattice of atoms. An electron is going to be attracted to one of the nuclei. So that would be represented by one of the troughs of this potential. And you could imagine the case where the barrier separating these different atoms on the lattice is very high. So this is the barrier height, which will be taken to be very large. So in that case, let me denote by n an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian describing a particle or the electron bound to be in the nth site, where n is an integer that goes from minus infinity to infinity. And I'll take a very simple approximation where we just have one state uh, for each uh, one bound state at each site. Although, of course, this can be generalized to the case where we have many bound states at each site. Okay. I'll just take the case where I have a particle uh, where it can be in one possible state at each site labeled by the integer n that tells you what site you're at. Okay. So the state n is an energy eigenstate. But of course, it's not an eigenstate of the translation operator. So if you want to consider the uh, description of the system in a way which is adapted to the symmetries, we want to consider the energy eigenstates, which are simultaneously eigenstates of this translation operator. So how do we do that? Well, one of the things that you probably already know is that plane waves are eigenstates of the translation operator. That is to say, they transform with the definite phase when you translate them. The state e to the i kx will just pick up a phase e to the i ka when you translate x to x plus a. 
So what you want is some sort of analog of a plane wave for this system. So let's consider the following. Consider the state theta, which is defined by a, su a linear superposition of all of these energy eigenstates weighted by the phase e to the i n theta, where theta is some number. And of course, these states will be labeled, will be distinctly labeled by this parameter theta if we take theta to live in the interval between minus pi and pi. So e to the i n pi is the same as e to the i to the minus i n pi, just because e to the 2 pi uh, i n is equal to 1. So that means that if you want to uniquely label these different states, you only need to take theta to run between pi and minus pi. So what happens? So of course, uh, the, all of these different ends are energy eigenstates. So any superposition of them is going to be an energy eigenstate. So clearly this state theta that I have written down is an energy eigenstate with uh, the same eigenvalue E naught. And what happens if you act on it with this translation operator? Well, it's the sum over n, e to the i, n theta of the state n plus 1. And you can then just relabel your summation. So let's define m to be n plus 1. And then you'll see that this can be written as a sum over m of e to the i m theta times the state m, all multiplied by e to the minus i theta. Okay. So that means that the state theta is an eigenvalue of the translation operator with eigen, an eigenstate of the translation operator with eigenvalue e to the minus i theta. So what do we see here? We see that there's an infinite degeneracy of states with energy E naught. And this infinite degeneracy can either be labeled in two ways. I could either think of it as the infinite degeneracy of integers, where I label the states by an integer n, or I could think about it as an infinite degeneracy of angles, where I label the states in the simultaneous eigenstate basis of t and h, meaning that I label the states by that continuous uh, parameter theta. Why is it useful, however, to label your states by this parameter theta rather than by m, it's useful because you could now imagine relaxing our assumption that the barrier is infinitely high. Okay. So if the height of the barrier is not infinite, the states will interact. But they'll interact in a way which will respect this translation symmetry. So the basis of states that we've developed for the infinite barrier case will still be useful. So let's consider the followest approximation, which is known as the tight binding, or alternatively, the nearest neighbor approximation. So let's say that the height of the barrier is large, but not infinite. In that case, if you start with a particle in one of these states, there'll be some small but non-zero probability if you start it in the lattice site n that it'll tunnel to n plus 1 or n minus 1. And then there'll be some much smaller probability that it'll tunnel to n plus 2 or n minus 2, and so on and so forth. And in the tight binding approximation, we just make the approximation that it's impossible for the particle to hop from one lattice site to another unless the uh, 
unless those two sites are nearest neighbors. I suppose uh, also, of course, the matrix element is non-zero if it's at the same site, because then it's just the energy eigenvalue. So, of course, the matrix element of H between uh, a given lattice site is given by uh, some energy eigenvalue E0. And I'll take the matrix element of H between two uh, neighboring sites to be some number that I'll call delta, and I'll take it to be much, much less than E0. And what is delta physically? Physically, delta tells you the probability per unit time that a particle is going to hop from one site to the one next door. So if you wanted to write out the Hamiltonian in a little bit more explicitly, all we're saying here is that the Hamiltonian acting on a given uh, energy eigenstate n is not given by E0 times n, but rather E0 times n plus a small correction reflecting the fact that there's some relatively small probability that it'll hop from one site to the one next door. Of course, you see now that the states n labeled by that integer that tells you what site the electron is sitting at are no longer the energy eigenstates. Instead, let's ask about the states theta. We've deformed the Hamiltonian in a way which is consistent with the translation symmetry. So you might hope that these states theta, which were the translation eigenstates, will remain energy eigenstates. So let's see what happens. So theta, I remind you, is just the sum overall of these uh, lattice sites n of e to the i n theta times the state where the electron is sitting in a given lattice site. So what is that? That's the sum over n of e to the i n theta times n. Well, so from this first term here, we just get and E naught times theta. And what do you get from the second term? We well, get minus delta times the sum over n of e to the i n theta times n plus 1 plus n minus 1. In other words, what is the how have we deformed the Hamiltonian? We've deformed the Hamiltonian by adding to it something proportional to the translation operator. Okay. So what is this? The first of those is something that we've worked out already. It's just the eigenvalue. It's just the action of the translation operator. So you get e to the i theta times n uh, times theta. Just by relabeling the summation over n, and the second of those, analogously, is e to the minus i theta times theta. Or, putting this all together, the state theta is an energy eigenstate with eigenvalue E0 minus 2 delta cosine theta. So what does this mean? This means that the degeneracy between the states has been lifted. The states are no longer exactly degenerate. Exactly degenerate. Instead, you have a continuous band of energy eigenstates with energies that run from e to the minus 2 delta all the way up to e to the plus 2 delta. Because, I remind you, theta 
runs from minus pi up to pi. So if you wanted to uh, give a picture, uh, yes, question. Is there any reason why we chose the energy to be negative for the site, the neighbor site? No. I mean, as you can see, if I change delta to minus delta, I would have just, uh, yeah, I would have just flipped the sign here. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I was feeling like putting a minus sign in the day that I wrote this lecture. Do, is there any, is there any more explanation needed than that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's conventional. It means, yeah. I don't really have a good explanation for why I put a minus sign there instead of a plus sign. Okay. So if you want to understand physically what's going on, let's make a picture of the spectrum. And let's consider what the spectrum looks like, the spectrum of energy eigenstates, as a function of delta. When delta is equal to zero, all of the eigenstates are degenerate. And they all live at this point E naught. But as you increase delta, the states live in some sort of band. And that band gets wider and wider and wider as delta increases. So as you allow these electrons at different lattice sites to interact with each other more and more, the band of allowed energy eigenstates gets wider and wider and wider. So, and this band of allowed energy eigenstates has a name. It's called the Brion zone. I don't know if I've spelled that correctly. No, I haven't. I would have never gotten that correct. This is why it's good to have notes. Um, and this uh, continuous band of energy eigenstates is very useful for understanding the structure of uh, materials which have a uh, periodic symmetry. So in particular, let's consider in more detail an electron Moving in, a, moving in a metal. So electrons are, of course, fermions. So because of the Pauli exclusion principle, the electrons will fill up all the states up to some energy level. And typically, this Fermi energy, so the critical value of the energy above which you haven't filled up any states, will lie in some continuous band of energy eigenstates. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you study the state where you filled up some energy uh, eigenvalues with a uh, a bunch of electrons, and then you imagine adding one more electron, then you can do so at very low cost and energy. And electrons are charged. They carry charge. So that means that there is a very low energy charge carrying excitation. There's some state where you can add more charge to the system and move it around at very low cost and energy. 
in the model that we've developed here at infinitesimally low cost and energy. What does this mean? This means that the material is a conductor. So this explains why metals conduct. In order for a material to be a conductor, it has to be really easy to add and remove charge to the system or to move charge around the system in some way. And if you have a periodic lattice such that all of the energy eigenstates lie in continuous bands, then because of that continuous structure, it's very easy to add an electron or remove an electron or move some electron around at very low cost in energy. And in particular, this intuitively explains something that you already know about metals. Okay. So for a metal at low temperature, the atoms are highly ordered. And so this lattice model, which I use to derive the uh, continuous energy eigenvalue spectrum, is going to be a very good approximation. And so your material will be a very good conductor. However, if you start heating up the metal, then all of the atoms are not going to live in some perfect ordered lattice, but they're going to be jumbled around some bit. They're going to be moving around a little bit. You won't have the exact lattice symmetry. And so you'll have some disordered state and your material will be a poor conductor. So what we have is a model which explains why metals are conductor and why they're better conductors at low temperature than at high temperature. So we typically have a name. So we give a name to highly ordered systems which have this sort of band structure such that they conduct. We call them metals. And we also give a name to the systems which are in such disordered state that they have no continuous bands of energy eigenstates so that they don't conduct. We call them glasses. Okay. So the two types of systems that one often studies in materials physics are metals, namely those states which are ordered, versus glasses, which are states which are disordered. And the characteristic distinction between these two different phases of matter is that in the metallic phase, the material conducts, and in the glassy phase, the material does not conduct. And you can see here that this is simply a consequence of the symmetry structure of a metal, namely that it's a system where all of the atoms are in some periodic array. Now, we have considered a very simple model of a metal, namely a one-dimensional metal. Okay. Most of the metals that we're interested in studying, most of the materials that we're interested in studying happen to live in three dimensions, because so do we. And so a typical material or a typical metal has a much more complicated band structure. So the typical picture that one would develop for some sort of metal is that if you look at the energy eigenstates, there would be some continuous bands of the sort that we studied in the simple one-dimensional case. And there would be some uh, uh, interesting structure where you would have some number of bands, each of which is continuous, but the relative spacing and the thickness of the bands will depend on the detailed structure of the system that you're studying. 
For example, it will depend on the strength of interactions between lattice sites, and it will also depend on the geometry of the lattice. So this band structure can be studied in part by considering more interesting lattices. So for a metal in one dimension, there's really only one kind of lattice that you could imagine. Well, that's not entirely true. But the na most natural lattice that you could imagine is one where you have a periodic spacing. But in two dimensions, for example, there are all sorts of more interesting lattices that we could consider. So example, you could, for example, you could consider a square lattice where all of your atoms lie on the edges of some square. So that would be an example of a very simple crystalline lattice. Or you can consider a more complicated, let's see if I can draw it correctly, hexagonal lattice. Okay. Which might have some structure like so. Oops. and on and on and ad, ad infinitum. Uh, I won't keep drawing. It could take me all day if I try and draw an infinite lattice. Um, so for example, uh, graphene is a system with a hexagonal lattice. Um, this is uh, a very uh, hot uh, new material. Uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, the discovery of uh, uh, various properties of graphene. Um, I think last year or the year two years ago. Yeah, um, and the way the primary tool that we study graphene quantum mechanically is by using the lattice symmetry of graphene, and in this case, a hexagonal lattice. Question. Um, uh, yeah. Well, it, 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 if you think about it, the middle of the hexagons are all. Uh, if you have atoms at the uh, lattice sites on the vertices here, then that is going to be identical, if you think about it, to lattice it, a lattice where you have things uh, in the middle of the hexagons. Okay. I think. No, I, yeah, no, I guess that's not true. The dual, yeah. So they're, they're actually, yeah. There are actually no notions of how you relate the lattice of things at a vertex with the lattice of things at the center. So this is the relationship between a lattice and a dual lattice. I actually don't remember what the dual lattice of the hexagonal lattice is. Um, but in the later in the rest of this class, we're going to consider a more simple version of that. Okay. So I guess it would be some sort of triangular lattice like that. Good question, though. Uh, yes. Any questions? Okay. okay. So we see then that the study of metals and of various different sorts of periodic uh, crystalline systems then reduces to a study of the possible sorts of discrete symmetries that such lattices can have. And it turns out that there are a finite number of such types of symmetries. The allowed symmetries are given by the so-called crystallographic groups. So for example, if you consider the square lattice that I've drawn on the left up here, then the set of allowed symmetries are some, wrote some discrete translations in the x direction and the y direction, along with some 90 degree rotation symmetries. Whereas if you consider the hexagonal lattice, you have some translations along with 120 degree rotation symmetries and 60 degree rotation symmetries. And so, the classification of possible lattices 
and the classification of possible symmetries is reduced to some sort of problem in geometry. Okay. And it's a solvable problem. It's a solved problem. I mean, in two dimensions, it was done by Euclid, I believe, um, or maybe Plato, one of these guys. Okay. They're called platonic solids. I guess that's the three-dimensional version. Um, but in two dimensions, I think the only allowed sort of lattices that one can have are things like hexagons, triangles, squares, trapezoids, rectangles, and so forth. Actually, there are also famously uh, not pu just periodic lattices, but other sorts of lattices that one, consider, uh, one can consider. There are lattices that are not periodic, but quasi-periodic, meaning that they're built out of some family of shapes, but they, you know, some finite family of shapes, but they have no <coughs> repeating structure. So they're, they're much more sophisticated models for materials. Um, you know, go, it, this is one of these uh, subjects that appears in recreational mathematics all the time, um, the subject of quasi-periodic tiling. Um, it actually does also appear. But um, most uh, systems, of course, at very low temperature would be described by some sort of periodic tiling, uh, which is classified by one of these uh, crystallographic groups. And so this constrains the possible band structures of metals that one can, can that one can have at low energy. So I'd like to spend the last uh, 15 minutes or so in this class just working out uh, one slightly more sophisticated example in a bit more detail um, of a lattice now in three dimensions. Maybe before I do so, do so, I should pause and see if there are questions. Have you guys seen band structure before? Um, it's often, I guess, how many of you are taking the condensed matter course? Okay, you will probably see it in that course. Have you seen it? Okay, yeah. Um, okay. I think one of the things that's lovely is that you can really derive so much interesting materials physics and condensed matter physics just from this consideration of symmetries. So let's consider a slightly more sophisticated example. Consider a lattice of atoms in three dimensions at positions given by three basis vectors AI which run from one up to three, times some integers n i, so let me call this r of n1, n2, and n3, which are going to be integers. So the simplest case would be where those three basis vectors a are just the three usual basis vectors of uh, three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates, x hat, y hat, and z hat in which case this would describe a perfectly cubic lattice. But you could imagine changing those vectors A to be something more complicated so that you would get some sort of more complicated lattice. And this is known as the Bravis lattice. So for example, in two dimensions, it might describe some sort of lattice of atoms all arranged at the corners of a trapezoid or in three dimensions, let's see, can I draw this? Sure. It might describe some more complicated, um, I don't know what the, uh, uh, sorry, parallelogram, not a trapezoid. I don't know what the three-dimensional version of a parallelogram is called. Is it parallelopiped? Good word. That's a 50 cent <laughs> word. Parallelopiped. Okay, I don't know how to spell it. I'm not even going to try. Okay. So you have some lattice of parallelopipeds, and your atoms live at the edges of those lattice. So the symmetries, then, are given by... So there's one symmetry for each vector of integers, and you have the translation operator, e to the i n dot p over h bar, 
where n is the vector n1 containing three integers. And this is the set of symmetries for all integers uh, n1, n2, n3. So an electron moving in this lattice will be subject to some potential and hence some Hamiltonian that is invariant under these translation symmetries. So we would like to use simultaneous eigenstates for the two operators, uh, the Hamiltonian and the symmetry generators T sub n. So let's think about what possible form these eigenvectors can take. So let's imagine starting out with an eigenstate or an eigenfunction psi of r, since I'm using the wave function language. And let's act on it with one of these translation symmetries. Okay. The fact that it's an eigenstate means that it will come back to itself multiplied by something. And in order for the eigenstate to be normalized out as r goes to infinity, that something has to be a phase. Actually, let's go. that something has to be a phase. It can't be a uh, real. Uh, it can't be a number with any norm aside from one. Otherwise, the norm of the wave function would blow up as you went to either r goes to plus infinity or minus to infinity in some way. And what else do you know? Well, you know that you can compose these translation symmetries in some way. You could do a translation by n1 by one n vector and by another n vector. So that tells you that this phase has the property that if you take two of them and multiply them, that's just the same as adding the vectors. So that theta of r just has to be linear in r. And a linear function of a vector is just a dot product of the vector with something. So I'll give a name to that vector that r is dotted with in the expression for k, for uh, theta. I'll call it k. Now, that's not an accident. OK. Um, one name for momentum is that it's the eigenvalue of a state under a translation. So e to the i uh, kx is the eigenvalue of an operator under a translation. And so what we have concluded here is that when you perform a translation on these energy eigenstates by one of these discrete amounts labeled by this vector of three integers n, you just get back a pure phase. So what that means is that a generic wave function will look like e to the i k dot r times something which is translation invariant. So this function u will have the property that u of r plus n, well, how should I say this? Tn acting on u of r is equal to u of r. It's a periodic function when you translate r by one of the vectors of this lattice. So if you wanted to draw a picture of what these wave functions look like, the wave functions look like some overall plane wave 
modulated by some function that is periodic in under the translation symmetries. So it might look like something like that. Sorry, I'm not very good at drawing this sort of thing. That's supposed to be a periodic thing. Okay, you know what I, you know what I mean. Okay, so you have some sort of envelope e to the i k r, and you have some modulating function u of r. So the fact that translation symmetry implies that your wave functions are just plane waves times some function that is periodic in the lattice spacing is known as Bloch's theorem. And the corresponding solutions to the equations of motion are known as Bloch waves. Now, the actual solution for the functions u of r is going to be very, very complicated in general. And it'll depend on the details of what sort of potential we're considering, and so on and so forth. But at the very least, in this model, you can understand a bit where the band structure comes from. To do that, Let's remember our one-dimensional example a little bit better. In our one-dimensional example, the analog of k was that angle theta that I introduced that parameterized the states. You know, our states are e to the i theta n, or e to the i theta x, if you wanted to call it that, times the state where you have a particle sitting at x equals to n. And we saw that theta couldn't take any possible value Theta could only take a certain range of values, and in particular, between pi and minus pi. So, in particular, if theta was equal to 2 pi, for example, then e to the 2 pi i n was just an integer, and so that was the same as theta equals to 0. And so, likewise, we have a similar observation that one can make here. If you have a vector k such that k times every element of the lattice, so let me call that dotted with n1a plus n2a2 plus n3a3 is equal to 2 pi times an integer, then that is equivalent to k equals zero. Because then all of the phases that will appear here will just be integers, or e to the 2 pi i times an integer. So they'll just be one. So we have a name for the set. So if I have a lattice. Uh, give, if I have this lattice, which is the linear combinations of all of these vectors A, where you multiply them by integers, we have a name for the lattice of vectors whose dot product of all of those things are an integer. We call that the dual lattice. I.e., if K is in the dual lattice or reciprocal lattice, Then the way then the wave function this is then this is equivalent to k equals zero. So if you wanted to describe this a little bit more systematically, you could think about it as follows. So let's consider the one-dimensional case again. So in principle, that angle theta could have been anything. But you observe that theta equals 2 pi is equivalent to theta equals 0. So that really means that theta is an angle 
that lives between 0 and 2 pi, or minus pi and pi. If you want to say that a little bit more specific, uh, a little bit more sophisticatedly, you would say that theta lives in the circle, which is the identification of the real numbers by the uh, translations, theta goes to theta plus 2 pi. So similarly here, K lives in the set of possible, uh, in three-dimensional space, the three-dimensional space where you impose the additional identification that anything in the dual lattice is equivalent to zero. So the important point is that effectively, K takes a finite range. So if you want to describe it mathematically, it lives in the quotient of three-dimensional space by the dual lattice. Okay. That's a mathematical word that you may not uh, care to pay attention to. Yes, sorry, there's a question. Okay, the reciprocal lattice is the lattice of vectors whose dot product with all of the original vectors is an integer. Okay, so uh, this statement is the same as that statement. That's the definition of the reciprocal lattice. Something that's not entirely obvious to you at this point is that the set of all vectors whose dot product with the vectors in the original lattice itself is a lattice, okay? Um, but that's a true statement. You can, you know, uh, I don't really have time to go through it now, but you could prove that to yourself if you like. I realize that I'm going through this a little bit quickly. I'm just trying to give you a, a general impression for how this, this theory works rather than trying to get you to uh, understand every single technical detail. And so, because of this, the energies will be labeled by two parameters. So they'll be labeled by an integer n because for a given value of k, there'll be a finite number uh, or a discrete set of u's, which are solutions to Schrodinger's equation, and also a continuous parameter n, which will form bands. So that, for example, you might have some energy spectrum where the lowest states would be labeled by an integer n equals zero, and k would take some continuous set of values, which allow the states to live in some sort of band here. And then you would have n equals 1. k would take some values that allow it to live in a band, and so on and so forth. The important point here is not the definition of a dual lattice or a reciprocal lattice or any of that nonsense. The important point is that the parameter k here, the momentum, that live that appears in this form for the wave function takes a continuous value, but it runs over a finite range. Just like theta took a continuous value, but it ran over a finite range. That means that the band of en allowed energy eigenstates is continuous, but finite. And so when studying the structure of metals, for example, one of the uh, primary tools that we have is, uh, an, is uh, an understanding of the band structure based on these sorts of considerations. And when you have situations where, for example, you vary the parameters of the metal by changing the temperature or by changing uh, the uh, structure, the content of the metal in some way, you can make these bands change and move around. And for example, when two bands come and hit each other, that's often when you'll have a phase transition of some sort. Um, no. Um, or uh, if you uh, change the number of free electrons in the metal such that suddenly it jumps between uh, one of these two bands, then suddenly you'll have some sort of insulating transition. Um, and so you can really understand the detailed structure of uh, metals by considering the band structure based on these sort of symmetry arguments. So this concludes everything uh, that I wanted to say about discrete symmetries. As you can see, um, they're incredibly important. 
And just as important are continuous symmetries, which we'll begin to learn about on Friday. Uh, I'm a little over time, so I'll stop here uh, and see you on Friday.